So if you brought a Bible with you here this morning and you'd like to open it up with me, as I said, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 8 here this morning and the message entitled, Follow Me. And really how I came with that title is pretty simple. I pulled it right out of the text. If you look here at uh, chapter 8, verse 34, at the end of the chapter, Jesus says this. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so this is the key, because as we observe these, the life of Jesus, really that's what we're doing, is we're studying through the Word of God. Especially in the Gospels, we see the life of Jesus. And so we want to follow after him. And we see many examples here in chapter 8 of the character and the nature of Jesus. And whenever we see Jesus' character, this is why I said when I prayed, uh, we should desire to want to be like Jesus. And we need to pray. And so today I pray that as we read through this, that God would minister to you truth. uh, And that we then would pray, God, this is where I'm falling short. This is how I don't match up. This is where I need to decrease and you need to increase in me. And pray that God would then will it in you. And then God would give you and I the ability to then become more and more like Jesus. And truly, as we're going to see here through these examples, this is a lifelong process. As we continually uh, die to ourselves and we are being transformed and changed more and more into the image and likeness of Jesus. And so let's pick up here at verse 1 in chapter 8. It says, Now in those days when there was again a large crowd, and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people, because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, And some of them have come from long distances. Verse 4 says, And his disciples answered him, Where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, Well, how many loaves do you have? And so something that's interesting here in chapter 8, when we left off in chapter 7, we saw that Jesus was up in the northern northwestern region of Tyre. Uh, This was kind of a coastal region. He was away from the Sea of Galilee. Then the scripture tells us that he made his way south and west to the Sea of Galilee, which then he crossed over the Sea of Galilee and went to the other side, which would be in the southeastern region of the Sea of Galilee around Gennesaret. In fact, the Bible tells us that he went through the region of Decapolis, And why this is important that I'm mentioning this is because it's important to understand a little bit of the geography. And in understanding the geography, we see here that Jesus is performing two separate miracles here. Because many people will study the text here and see that in chapter 6, remember we just read Jesus performed a miracle where he fed 5,000 people. That number, of course, is more than 5,000, but it's at least 5,000 men, including women and children. That number could have been significantly higher. But here in chapter 7, we see that Jesus is feeding now 4,000. The number would be, again, 4,000 men. There would be more women and children, of course. But many people will say that this is just a repeat miracle. It's the same miracle. And it is not for a couple reasons. The first one I just stated geographically These two miracles happen in two different regions. And a little deeper than that, in some context, not only are they two different regions, what we see is that northwestern region of the Sea of Galilee is more predominantly Jewish. So there would have been more Jewish people in that region. Whereas here we see this miracle that we're going to read about right now when Jesus feeds the 4,000, you're going to see that this is more of a Gentile uh, group. And for example, you can see some of the terminology when it talks about picking up the baskets. In chapter 6, we see a different word for baskets than we do here in chapter 8. 
The one in chapter 8 is referencing more of a term of a Gentile basket. And so these are some of the things scholars point to. Uh, but the main one, again, is, is that Jesus is in two different regions. And so here Jesus, again, he has a large crowd following him. And it very plainly says in verse 2 that Jesus felt compassion. And what did he feel compassion for? He felt compassion for their physical needs. That they had been following him three days, they had not eaten, and they were hungry. And he was worried that if he sent them away hungry, uh, after three days of not eating, they would have been physically weakened. And he was worried that they could have maybe fainted or fallen along the way. And I love that Jesus here is compassionate, guys. When we look at all these miracles or these signs is really what they are, but they're miracles, we see that Jesus' miracles are always directed at others. When Jesus raises people from the dead, it's because he was feeling compassion for the people. When he was healing people. So Jesus' miracles are always pointed or addressed to others. And so... Jesus here having compassion on people, and I'm so thankful here today that we serve a God and we call him our Father who is compassionate towards us. I love what Isaiah chapter 58 verse 10 says. It says, if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like the midday. You see, there is something in losing yourself in the service of God that then blesses other people. Jesus was never concerned about himself. He never performed any of these miracles to satisfy himself. He never, remember even the devil in the first two chapters of Matthew, when Jesus was being tempted. Remember the devil said, And he pointed to some stones and he said, if you're hungry, take those stones and turn them into bread. Well, Jesus had all power and ability and authority to be able to do that. But Jesus did not turn those uh, stones into bread. He didn't do any of these miracles. He didn't exercise any of his power and his authority over nature to benefit himself. Jesus is pointing something to you and I here. That when we have him living within us, guys, we will gradually begin to die to ourselves. We will gradually begin to care less about our needs and more about other people's needs. And there's a very important key to that. That you can't care for others until you first have been cared for from God. You see, Jesus finds his substance in God. Jesus didn't need men and women to care for him. He found his comfort in God. He found his provision in God. And so Jesus received from God, which then gave him the ability to love other people, to minister to other people. And so first, there's a lesson for us that we need to receive from God. We need to eat of that manna from heaven. We need to have our spiritual food, our filling, so that we are then full and satisfied in God. And we are full How can we minister the gospel and God's love if we first have not received God's love? How can you explain and express the love of God if you don't know that love of God? And so it's important for us first to receive from God so that we can then give to others. I love that Jesus, speaking about compassion, there's an interesting little uh, story here in Matthew chapter 25 that I want to read at verse 34. Because for us to care for other people, this is a, a Christian staple <laughs> to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's a staple. That's the greatest commandment that God gives. And so there's something to this caring for people. And I think in today's age, it's sad, but the more we become introverted, the more we become uh, full of self, the more jaded and the more hardened we come between uh, others or to others. And it's a very sad thing seeing people become more and more callous towards one another. And so look at this example here in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. 
and I will point to this parable. Jesus is setting this in the context of when he returns, and it's a picture at the judgment seat of Christ. But look at verse 34. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, this is speaking of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Verse 37 says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or naked and clothe you? When when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And so what a powerful picture here uh, that Jesus is saying on that day. Uh, Jesus is going to say, Enter in, you on my right hand side, you sheep of my fathers, that you have done these great things. You have done these good things. And they will say to him, oh, you know, when did we see you do these things, Jesus? When were you poor? When were you naked? When were you hungry? And what did Jesus say? As you have done to the least of these. So in other words, the way that we do to the poor today, the way that we help those in need today. And when we are helping them with the right heart because we have compassion for them, because we love them, that when we do these things to them, we are doing them to Jesus Christ. And that's why, guys, truly, anything we do for the Lord should be for the Lord, should be done for Him. But what an amazing picture here uh, that Jesus um, always giving of Himself. And this is where it begins, the denying of ourselves. You think of in Matthew chapter 27, at verse 38 to 43, another example of Jesus here not caring for himself. Because why? Because he had been satisfied in God. Because he was getting his fulfillment from God. But this horrible picture here, as Jesus is on the cross in agony and pain, and remember, it, weren't, it wasn't the nails in Jesus' hands and his feet that were holding him to that cross. It was his love for you and I. It was him paying the sins of the world. He did it willfully. Remember, Jesus says nobody uh, crucifies the Son of God. Uh, Jesus, nobody takes my life. I lay down my life, right, willingly, so that he may pick it up again. But as Jesus is there doing what he came to do, People were walking by, and the scripture says they were wagging their heads at, them, at him. And what were they saying? If you're the son of God, take yourself down off of that cross. And truly, if those people had any clue that Jesus had the ability to take himself off of that cross, they wouldn't have said that. But what they're doing is they're mocking him. If you are the son of God, take yourself down off of that cross. Then they went a step further. And this is my point. They said of him that he was able to save others, but he can't save himself. Right? Jesus wasn't here to satisfy his own needs, his own desires. Jesus had the ability to take himself down off of that cross, but he chose not to because he knew that in dying on the cross and being raised from the dead, that you and I can now be saved, that you and I can now become children of God. And so Jesus, again, it's just a matter of, of finding our satisfaction in God, finding our identity in God, and He satisfies us. But these people were wagging their heads at Him because Jesus wasn't concerned for Himself. He was concerned for others. You see, Jesus always entrusted Himself to the Father to care for his needs so that Jesus' focus could be on serving others and caring for others. Turn with me real quick to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. We see something here in John, chapter 5, verse 19. 
says, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Flip over to chapter 6, verse 38. Continuing on this point, verse 38 says, For I, Jesus speaking, have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Right? Jesus didn't come to do his own will. Whatever Jesus felt like doing, he came to do the will of the Father. He always had himself submitted and surrendered fully to the Father. And so what was the will? What was God's will for him to come and to accomplish? Well, he answers us that in verse 39. It says, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. What is the will of God for Jesus to do? Well, it just says right there to not lose anything that the Father has entrusted to him. Right? And for anyone who beholds the Son, that they will then have everlasting, eternal life in him. And so this is the will. This is what Jesus' focus was. This is why Jesus was just as hungry as those people for these three days. But Jesus didn't sneak away and pray that God would just bless him with some food so that then he could minister to the other people. That would probably be my prayer. God, give me the strength so that I can then go serve others. Jesus here prayed not for himself. He prayed for the others. And what an amazing thing here as we see our Lord. And so three days these people had been out traveling with him. And anyone who has fasted for any time knows that in two or three days, your body becomes very physically weak. And so these ones were very hungry and weak. Jesus had compassion on them. And notice what he says to the disciples. I love this. He asked the disciples, how many loaves do you have? And truly, remember that first miracle in chapter 6. Jesus took the loaves and the fish from the little boy, from his lunch. Here we see Jesus asking his disciples, what do they have? And the disciples responded in verse um, 4. says, and they said, 7, verse 6 says, And he directed the people to sit down on the ground, and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them, and started giving them to the disciples to serve them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish, And after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied. And they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalamutha. And so again, Jesus performs a miracle of multiplying these loaves. I find it fascinating that when Jesus asked, the disciples first just gave him these loaves. It would appear that Jesus blessed the loaves and distributed the loaves. And after the disciples saw the bread multiplying again, then all of a sudden the disciples remembered they had some fish here. And so then they gave the fish to Jesus. And, and you know... I don't want to read too far into that, but sometimes I think that uh, we see a lot of ourselves in the disciples. Uh, They wanted to make sure Jesus was going to be able to make that bread stretch again, as he already did once, before they cough up the, the fish, possibly. But here we see that Jesus performs this miracle, and it's the same way he performed the first feeding of the 5,000. What did he do? He took the fish, he looked to heaven, And he thanked God for the provision. And see, guys, there is something to this. In fact, the Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew about believing, when we ask God for something, believing that we have it before we even have it. Right? That is praying in faith. That is is being thankful. Jesus didn't thank God after the bread was multiplied. Jesus thanked God before the bread 
was multiplied. And there's power in that. Uh, not only is that praying in faith and believing God is able, but it's also being grateful. I love what 1 Timothy 4, 5, because we should be grateful whether we have one loaf of bread or if we have seven loaves of bread. And so being grateful for what we have. And there is something to this gratitude and these miracles. But 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 reminds us that everything created by God is good. And nothing should be rejected if it is received with gratitude. And so what a picture for us to remember being thankful and thanking God and uh, thanking Him for the many blessings. And so here back at verse 8, says, And they ate and were satisfied. They picked up the seven large baskets. Again, not only does God bless, but there's always an abundance. There's uh, leftover bread again. And it says about 4,000 people were there. Then He sent them away now that they had the energy and the strength to make their trek back home. And immediately then Jesus entered the boat and he shoved off to the district of Dalamuth. Verse 11 says, The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation Leaving them, he, he, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And so here we see again the Pharisees continue to follow Jesus around, the religious leaders. And here they come to Jesus. And the Bible says that they were arguing with him or looking to argue with him. And what are they asking? Well, they're asking for him to perform a sign or a miracle. And the religious leaders, truly, a lot of times we give them a bad rap, and for good reason, because Jesus gave them a bad rap. Uh, Jesus would call them brood of vipers, right? And, and, and um, whitewashed tombs and uh, hypocrites and all kinds of things. But here you have to give them a little bit of, of room because the Pharisees are, in a way, trying to protect against false teachers, and false prophets. That was part of their job. To make sure that uh, false teachers were being identified. Okay? But here's the problem with the religious leaders. The Pharisees. Yes, this was a responsibility of theirs. Which I will include to the church now too. Leaders in the church. The letters are to the churches are riddled. Uh, from the Apostle Paul. With warnings to those who are in leadership. To beware of false teachers. Or to beware of those who come into the fellowship who are trying to act like sheep, but really they are wolves in sheep's clothes. And to be aware and to test these spirits, right? Because not every spirit is of God. Not everyone who says Jesus is Lord, right, it has a converted heart, is, is truly a child of God. And so we need to be aware. But here's where the religious leaders fell short. You see, they were using their own measuring stick to measure people. Remember in the previous chapter, when they were accusing Jesus and his disciples of not going through the ceremony or the traditions of men of washing their hands. You see, they were using the measuring stick of their own traditions. And so this is where we need to be careful because these religious leaders, now they're seeking for a sign. So yeah, they're trying to guard against false teaching, but they themselves were false teachers. They themselves were uh, the problem. And here we're going to see Jesus calls them out uh, on them uh, having the, the leaven, as Jesus is going to warn about uh, the Pharisees, the leaven of the Pharisees. And so Jesus here, they're looking for a sign. And truly, uh, Jesus says there will be no sign given to this generation. Now, in these days, remember, the people were anxious, the Jews were anxiously awaiting the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah, the Old Testament scriptures had been speaking uh, of this Messiah and prophesying about this Messiah to come. And so truly, people were looking for the Messiah to come. During this day and age, there were many men who would come through the towns and they would perform or they would 
uh, say they were going to perform these great miracles because they were professing to be the Messiah. You see, there were other men. There was only one man who entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey who was Jesus Christ himself, who was the Messiah. But truly, in this day and age, many men were coming on the scene and declaring to be the Messiah. And so there's records of these men de- describing these miracles that they were going to perform or these signs to prove that they were the Messiah. So again, the Pharisees, uh, this wasn't the first guy who came on the scene who declared to be the Messiah, although Jesus' miracles were really happening. Jesus' power was being uh, expressed, and so uh, we need to remember that. Uh, The Messiah sounds like a big word, but what does that mean? The Messiah simply means the anointed one. And so Israel was looking for this long-awaited anointed king who would come and sit on the throne of David. In their mindset, they were thinking and waiting for the Messiah to come to set up his kingdom so that they could then overthrow the Roman government and Israel would now become this great kingdom like it once was. And so this is what the people were expecting. This Messiah was going to come, overthrow the Romans, and set up the kingdom. This is what the expectation was. But you see, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were looking for a sign, yet they were not able to see the miracles. It's almost like the religious leaders, these little raising people from the dead and and opening the eyes of the blind and making the lame walk and all of these great miracles that Jesus has already performed. It's like that wasn't enough for them. They wanted maybe a bigger miracle. Maybe they wanted to see like God did in the book of Genesis when, or Exodus when God opened up the Red Sea and walled up the water on every side so that the nation Israel could flee And then God could close that again on their enemies. Maybe this is what they were looking for. Maybe it was Elijah. They wanted Elijah to call down fire from heaven. They wanted a miracle. They wanted proof that Jesus was the Son of God, that He was the Messiah. And truly, when it comes to these signs, guys, and these miracles, I love miracles more than anyone else, or probably like you guys. I love seeing the miraculous power of God. Who doesn't? But here's the reality, that miracles really only produce an appetite for more miracles. Miracles do not produce faith. You see, we can't base our relationship with God on these miracles. There's actually a danger in doing so, and not being rooted and grounded in the Word of God and having our faith anchored in the Word of God, not these signs and not these miracles. Here's the danger of it, that we're told in, Uh, Matthew, that in the last days, that there will be many false prophets and many false teachers who come on the scene. And what are they doing? They're performing great miracles. They're deceiving people with magic and, and these sorts of things. And so as Christians, yes, we need to be in awe of the miracles of God. But at the same time, we need to be aware And on guard against guarding against our faith being based on these miracles. For example, if God doesn't provide for me this week or this month, right? If God doesn't drop that check in my hand this week, right? Then then I'm not going to believe God. Then God isn't faithful, right? People will base their faith on a miracle or on this great thing. And, And I will say... When it comes to these miracles, I've seen miracles. You've seen miracles. Miracles should begin to move within us an awe towards God. Right? We rejoice with these things. When people are healed, when miraculous things that we can't explain happen. But truly we know that the miraculous things don't always happen. And so what happens to your faith if all of a sudden one time, for God's reasons, not ours... That miracle doesn't happen. Then what? Is your faith shipwrecked? Well, hopefully your faith is more sturdy than that. Then you should be able to go to the Word of God and your faith should be rooted in the Word of God, not on these signs and miracles because many people will come to deceive with these miracles, just like in this day and age. 
Men were coming on the scene proclaiming to be something that they weren't. And how were they proving it? Well, they would have these miracles that they would try to perform. And so they wanted to see a great miracle. And Jesus says no miracle will be given. Remember what Paul says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1.22. That Jews will ask for a sign, which they are doing here. And Greeks will seek for wisdom. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus in, an, in the other gospel, along the same lines, when the religious leaders were asking for a sign, Jesus stepped it up even a little further. And he said, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. In fact, if I remember it right, Jesus even says this uh, wicked generation. It's Matthew 16, verses 1 through 5. Yeah, it says the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and they were testing him and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But Jesus replied to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern the appearance or you... Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? Verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And again, you know, those people who are always craving the miracles, uh, again, we should glorify God and the miracles when they happen. But to constantly pursue the miracles, to me can become very dangerous. In fact, Jesus says here, it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. This is why we should seek more after Jesus, right? And denying ourselves and having Christ in us and being transformed more into the image and the likeness of Jesus. Because I'll tell you, that is a more powerful miracle than anything else. Because you cannot deny that testimony. You see, miracles, we can write off, can't we? Oh, that just happened. People do it all the time. Oh, that just happened. That was just random. Well, as Christians, we know that there aren't randoms. There aren't coincidences, right? But you see, when a life is changed and transformed, that is an irrefutable testimony of the power of God, that the human heart can be changed. And so verse 14 here, back in Mark, it says, and they had forgotten, speaking of the disciples again, switching back. It says, and they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. Verse 15, and he was giving orders to them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, Twelve. Jesus says, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you still not understand? And so here, the disciples, just kind of a cute little thing, but it's really, it's, it's not. And we'll get to this here in a minute. But Jesus gives them this warning. He says, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of of Herod. Now we know when we reference scripture that leaven in the Bible always is a picture and a type of sin. And so Jesus is saying, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The Jews, we still do it today, uh, but when you are making bread, since Jesus just performed a miracle of breaking bread, uh, very fitting that he would make this comment, uh, this analogy with the Pharisees and leaven and bread. Because remember, when you're making bread, what do you do? You get yeast, uh, a type of leaven, really. It's yeast. And the yeast is the secret 
to make bread rise. If you just took a lump of dough, bread, and you stuck it in the oven, when that thing would bake, it would just be flat. It would have nothing to it. But in order to make that lump of dough rise and make it really nice and make it a lot bigger, uh, what you do then is you take yeast or you take leaven and you just take a little bit of it. And here's the point. You don't have to saturate that whole lump of dough with the yeast and mix it all in. All you need to do is get a little piece of that yeast, a little piece of that leaven, and you stick that in that lump of dough so that when you put it in the oven, then what happens is that leaven or that yeast begins to permeate throughout that loaf, which then makes it rise and makes it yummy and makes it good. Right? But not when we're talking about sin, because this is what sin will do also, guys. See, it's not always that big sin that we commit that all of a sudden just shipwrecks our life. It's just a little bit of sin. Because sin is just like leaven. It, 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 it wants to permeate your life. And so we think we're just doing a little bit. And hey, I'm not really hurting anyone, you know. It's not like one of the big Ten Commandment sins. It's just, you know, probably like number 29. But see, it's a little sin. Because that little sin begins to permeate, right? I mean, how many people do you know that are struggling with addiction? That didn't start out living on the streets and not having a job and having lost their family and having no money and in and, and jail now because they robbed a bank. No. How does that start? Well, it usually starts when you just kind of go out and have a good time. You let, down, let off your guard. You blow off some steam. And you begin taking it easy. But you see that appetite. That appetite. It, it's sin. A little sin begins to grow. And the next thing you know, the person who doesn't know how to exercise self-control begins to want this more and more. And to feel good and to forget about the pains of the world, to forget about the past, to take their mind off of the future. I just kind of want to gel out. I want to veg out. I just want to have peace. I just want to be free from all of these burdens. I'll tell you, that's how addiction starts. It numbs the pain. But that pain isn't always a physical pain. There may be an external little pain, but what's causing that pain is a deeper pain. And so people are trying to satisfy and trying to numb this pain. And so they find any means possible. How many people do you see? It's sad. I mean, we have a huge opioid epidemic. People who are good, law-abiding people, lawyers and doctors, who are living their lives above bar, who then have an accident or something. And so what does the doctor do? I, these doctors, man, I think they're just very quick. And, of course, they're kind of in the middlemen between the pharmaceutical companies and this and that. We won't get into all that. But they're so willing and able to just hand you a prescription. And so the guy is in pain or the girl's in pain. They take that prescription. They go get it filled. And they're in pain. And they pop one of those pills. And they're like, whoa, hey, you know, let's go run a marathon. It's a magic drug. So when that pain comes back again, what do you do? You pop another one. You pop another one. But the problem is your body begins to build a tolerance. So then what do you have to do? Well, I need to pop two now. And then I need to pop four. Then I need to pop six. Then the next thing you know, you're not making it to work. Because now all you want to do is you want to just veg out. You don't want to feel pain. You don't want to have to deal with reality. You want to check out for a while. That's the danger. That's the danger. It starts so small and then it, it permeates because remember, sin's desire is for you and I. But we must master it. We must master it. That's what God told Cain in the garden or in Genesis. And so leaven, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of this sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9 says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. See, it doesn't take a whole lot. It just takes a little. And so what was the leaven of the Pharisees? That's my question. If I need to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, well, then what is the leaven of the Pharisees? Thank God the Bible answers that. Turn with me to John chapter 12. 
and we'll get the answer for what the leaven of the Pharisees was. John chapter 12, starting at verse 33, says, So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become the sons of light. Continue here. It says, These things Jesus spoke, and he sent away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and he has hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. Verse 41. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Verse 42. Nevertheless, many Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would put out, be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. So what was the sin of the Pharisees, the leaven? It was unbelief. It was their unbelief. And truly, when you think about it, guys, Unbelief is really a hardening of the heart. It was the hardening of their hearts that began to cause unbelief. And so truly, we need to be on guard against the hardening of our hearts. It starts small, doesn't it? It starts small, just like that leaven, just like that yeast. Well, the, a little hardening of the heart. What happens? It becomes harder and harder and harder. It's like the example God gave to us through the Pharaoh of Egypt. That the Pharaoh would see these miracles that Moses and Aaron were able to perform before him. The staff turning into a serpent and then turning back into a staff. All of the plagues. All of these amazing signs and miracles that God was performing. Did these have a positive effect on Pharaoh and the Egyptians? Well, towards the end of those plagues, you begin to see cracks in the armor of the Pharaoh where the, the Pharaoh would, would say, okay, you're right. And they, he would submit to God and he would say, okay, go. And so then the people would begin to leave and Pharaoh would change his mind. Why? Because that heart had begun hardening little by little. And once that heart, gets, that heart gets to the place where it becomes solidified, that's a dangerous place. There is a point. There is a point where men can absolutely reject the Holy Spirit. And God, being a God of grace and mercy and truth, will give people what they want. Not joyfully. It doesn't bring God pleasure when the wicked perish. Those are God's creation. Those are God's people, but they're rejecting God. They're rejecting life. And so what happens is the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The picture there, when you begin to uh, look at the words and the definitions, it's more of a shoring up. It's not that God made him hard towards him. It was Pharaoh hardening his own heart, his unbelief, that then came to the point where God just sealed it. God said, this is what you want. You got it. And that is a sad, sad day. And so truly, we need to be on guard against the hardening of the heart. Listen, guys, we can fall into spiritual ruin if we harden ourselves against God's word. That's where it starts. It's hardening our hearts against God's word. God's word, clear as day, pierces my heart. And I choose to say, yeah, you know what, but... But, God, I know this is what your word says, but I just feel that this is the right thing. I just saw a great miracle and a sign, and, and, but your word says something different. But, but I like the miracle and I like the sign. 
You see, it becomes very dangerous. Again, that appetite will only increase for these miracles. And so we need to be on guard that we aren't hardening our hearts towards God's word, not even just a little bit, right? Because it's just that little bit, like that little bit of yeast that goes into that dough, it will begin to permeate. And so the disciples here, as Jesus gives this warning about the leaven of the Pharisees, they started discussing, verse 16, amongst themselves, worried that Jesus uh, knew that they'd forgotten some bread. And what an amazing thing is Jesus is trying to teach a very deep spiritual truth here. And these disciples are still thinking about the physical. Remember, Jesus even says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the Father's mouth. You see, there is a food that is more important for us. There's a food that we need for our souls that is more than the physical food. And so Jesus here, what does he do? Well, he kind of confronts the disciples. Now, anytime Jesus is confronting his disciples here, it amazes me that Jesus is able to do this with such graciousness. You know, I think too many times I get a little excited and, and maybe I shout things. And that's not to say that when Jesus is correcting his disciples or confronting them, that he is demeaning them or he's yelling at them. Although he had every right to, because those disciples truly were like you and I, were very stubborn and not understanding. And so Jesus gently here, I have to believe if we could hear his voice was firm but gentle, it was with love. And Jesus asked them, don't you understand? Can't you remember just a couple days ago, guys, when there was 5,000 people and you were complaining that there was nothing to eat and how were they going to find something for them to eat? And I took the little boy's fish and loaves and I looked up and I gave thanks to my father and that bread multiplied and fed thousands of people. Don't you remember what just happened? Don't you remember this, guys? Now here I broke seven loaves and we fed almost 4,000 and yet you guys still don't understand. And so to me, Jesus confronting these disciples, he's doing it in love. But what is his point? It's their lack of understanding. That's what he's upset about. Upset in a gentle way. But it's their lack of understanding. You see, the disciples honestly should have done better. They should have been able to say, hey, just a couple days ago, Jesus was able to take care of it. Instead of them worrying about, what are we going to do now? Oh, no, we're busted. He knows we forgot the bread. You see, I think they should have done better, guys. And if they would have just applied the knowledge they already had, here's where I think the understanding comes into play. What was the understanding they should have just understood? That God had already previously done something. If they would have just applied the knowledge they already had. Because what can we know for a fact about the nature of God? Is that God is faithful. And so this understanding isn't something that we have to try to figure out. It's simply understanding what God has already done. This is the understanding that Jesus is talking about. And we know that God is faithful. I love what 1 Corinthians 1.9 says. It says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord what about Hebrews 10 verse 23 says let us that's you and I too guys hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised promised underline that word he who promised is faithful this is our understanding so for you and I uh, when Trials come and things come into our life and we begin to be like the disciples and what are we going to do now? Well, the understanding that Jesus would say to us is, is look back. Look back at the faithfulness of God. And then once you look back and you remember the faithfulness of God, you go right back to Hebrews 10.23, that underlined word that says promised. Promised. That's a promise. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. See, he who began this good work, it's him who's faithful to complete it. That's a promise. 
that he is faithful. And so the disciples here, again, Jesus, and Jesus didn't even continue on right here with the spiritual point he was trying to make. See what Jesus did? The compassion of Jesus being the ultimate teacher and having love in his heart. He met them where they were at. They were still thinking about the bread. So Jesus says, okay, you guys want to talk about the bread? Then we'll go back to the bread. Here's another little principle and lesson for you with the bread. I love that about Jesus. Because some of us are a little slower learners than others, maybe. I'm raising my hand. Some of us have to have a little more description, a little more um, teaching. And so truly, though, Jesus, the ultimate teacher here, verse 22, says, And they came to Bethsaida. And they brought him a blind, and he, the blind man, implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? Verse 24 says, And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began seeing everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. So Jesus again enters now back into Bethsaida. So we're back up in the northwestern region of the Galilee, Sea of Galilee. And here yet another man comes to him, and Jesus didn't turn him away. As we know, Jesus is full of compassion. And so what did he do? Well, the man asked if Jesus would put his hands on him and heal him. And so what did Jesus do? Here, another extraordinary miracle. And what did Jesus use again? This time he used spit again. Remember the last miracle with the guy. He uh, spit, took saliva from his tongue and put it on the other guy's tongue, the guy who was mute. And then he took his fingers and stuck his fingers in the guy's ear who couldn't hear. And again, just amazing different ways that Jesus chooses to heal people. And here this guy, something interesting about this miracle that we see in no other place in the Bible is this kind of perpetual healing, right? It was like a partial healing. What happened at first? Jesus spit on his eyes and the guy opened his eyes. And what happened? He said, well, I see trees moving around. So it's like he had a partial vision, but there was no clarity. He couldn't identify that they were people. They just looked like trees. So then Jesus put his hands on him again, and then all of a sudden he had full clarity. He was able to see clearly. And again, what would this be pointing to? Well, it could be pointing to a lot of things. One, that Jesus, again, you can't put him in a box. You can't say Jesus only works this way. He only heals in this manner. Jesus used many different varieties of ways to heal people. And what I like to think of here, Pastor Chuck talked about this, that we see this partial healing. And he kind of referenced it to uh, doctors today. You know, many people, and I think wrongly, this is personally, I think wrongly that people think by going to the doctor when there's something wrong, uh, that you aren't expressing faith in God being able to heal you. In fact, there's a brother in this church who had, I think it was his grandmother, who for years was suffering from some ailment where she couldn't get out of bed and this and that. And she stayed in bed and continued to pray because her pastor told her that she just needs to wait on God to heal her and to not go to the doctor. And so this lady for years laid in that bed in agony and pain until one day somebody else came along and says, no, you need to go to the doctor. And so she went to the doctor and the doctor prescribed something or did something and, and she had no more pain and she was healed with medicine and so here's the point with this partial healing think about this for a minute guys that any healing any healing is divine any healing is divine from god it's a process that comes from god even if it is used by the hand of a doctor you see, the doctor simply understands the process which he has studied, right? The doctors don't come up with their own creative ways to uh, make the body be manipulated. And, and think about it. Our bodies have healing agents within themselves. And so what does a doctor do? For example, when maybe part of your intestine needs to be removed. Well, the doctor sedates you. 
gets a scalpel, cuts you open, goes under there, cuts out the bad portion of the intestine, and then he puts it back together, the tissue, and they maybe stitch it up a little bit. But what happens? It takes the tissue within itself to begin to migrate and to heal itself and to make that connection full. So yes, the doctor had a part in the healing, but really uh, every healing is divine because the body has to heal itself. There's only so far the heart doctor can go with the heart. There's only so far the brain doctor can go with the brain. A lot of them, what they're doing through a lot of schooling, (laughs) a lot of schooling is already understanding the healing process that is already in the human body and figuring these things out. And so I'll say this, that, you know, you pray when you're in in an ailment, in a condition, you pray and and you wait on God and then you pray and then you go to the doctor and see what the doctor has to say. Unless God has specifically said to you and it better be clear and you better be able to back it up with the word of God that it is for you to just wait for God to miraculously heal you. You see, part of the process, the doctors can't control this process. It's a natural healing process. So here with this partial healing, we see a lot of times where people are sick and Jesus just says the word and they're 100% healed. There's other times where here uh, it's a partial healing. And so there is a process. And so doctors just understand this process. Our own bodies, as I said, guys, have a divine healing process built in. And it's not any less divine Because it's natural. Because who is it that created our bodies? It was God. And so it's not any less divine allowing the body to do what the body naturally does. It's still divine because God is the one who created it that way. That I can get a cut on my hand and I can scream like a girl or a baby. Some tough girls out there. I'm sorry. That's why I always tell Zachary. But you could cut your finger, right? We know this. And it hurts. And so what do you do? You put a little ointment on there and you put a Band-Aid on it. And a week later, you open it up and wow, by golly, it's healed. And so just because it is natural doesn't mean it's any less divine because God has created all things. He has created our bodies. And so let's continue here. Let's try to get through a couple more verses. Verse 27 says, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to not tell anyone about him and so guys again jesus just asked his disciples who do people say that i am and truly jesus isn't overly concerned about who people say that he is he makes this question because he ultimately cares about what the disciples believe and so many people were saying he's john the baptist remember even herod a couple chapters ago thought that jesus was john the baptist incarnated Uh, Many thought he was Elijah or just one of the prophets. And so then Jesus asked Peter, and I think Matthew gives us a little more description into this account encounter. And I love it because Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, when Jesus asked Peter, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And remember that Christ is Jesus's title, the Messiah, the anointed one. His name isn't Jesus and his last name, Christ. Christ is his title. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And so then Jesus would even go on and tell Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so truly, guys, we need to see Jesus for who he is, that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one who came and died uh, a suffering a horrible death so that we may live. right? Because as we'll look at next week, when Jesus first begins to tell his disciples that he must suffer and that he must die in the next 
paragraph that the disciples are kind of shocked, especially Peter. And Peter, who loved Jesus, got kind of emotional, right? I don't think Peter was outright just rebuking Jesus because Peter thought he was some great guy. It bothered Peter to hear that Jesus was going to suffer. He didn't want Jesus to go suffer. Who, who wants a family member or a good friend to go through agony like that? Nobody does unless you're twisted. But it's amazing that Jesus is going to explain to them that he must go through this suffering. There were two things that Jesus came to do. One of them was is that he had to take care of this issue of man's sin against God. Number one. He had to take care of the issue of sin. And he is the only one who could take care of that issue. The second thing that he did when he suffered and died on the cross, well, it was an expression to you and I of God's love for mankind. It was for God's love. And so where we'll close is with this verse, speaking on the first of those two, that Jesus came and he had to suffer and die to take care of the sins of mankind. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Very beautiful portion of Scripture here. Colossians chapter 2, at verse 13, says, When you, that's you and I, guys, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He, Jesus, made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. See, Jesus, what did he do? Well, he took away our sins. He died there on the cross. He canceled out the certificate of debt. That a debt that you and I couldn't pay, he paid for us. And beautiful that he took out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Remember, paid in full, right? Paid in full, guys. It is finished. To tell us, die. What a beautiful thing. And then also verse 15, when he disarmed the rulers and authorities. How did he disarm the rulers and the authorities? Well, he raised himself from the dead. He rose on the third day, conquering death, conquering the grave, and conquering the enemy. What a beautiful picture, guys. So this is what we're celebrating here. We're going to do communion. And we're remembering Jesus' death on the cross that satisfied those two things. right? Our sin canceled out the debt of sin and also the love of God. We'll look at that one next week in 1 John. The, the beautiful display of God's love for you and I. Something that I think the world needs a little more of, especially this day and age. Men need to confess their sins to God. Right? What did that scripture say about the Pharisees? That many believed Him, but they didn't confess Him. Many people believe that God is God and that Jesus existed, but they don't confess Him. You see, there's a difference. Believing is more of a logical thing, I believe, whereas confessing is an admitting. Admitting what? Well, admitting, for starters, that you are a sinner, that I am a sinner, that we have fallen short. Confessing this to God and then confessing Him as our Lord and our Savior, not as just believing Him, but confessing Him means that I'm taking this knowledge and I'm applying it to my life. That He isn't just my Savior, He's my Lord. And I follow Him. I don't believe Him, but follow somebody else. Doesn't that sound kind of weird? I believe you, but I'm not going to follow you. I'm going to follow somebody else. That's the picture. Don't just believe Him, follow Him. Confess Him. And let Him begin to grow within us and to change us from glory to glory. And have the joy of the Lord, the confidence that in that day when He returns, because He is returning. I pray He's returning soon.
But when he returns, we don't want to cower in the corner somewhere ashamed of our Lord. We want to stand with confidence, not our own confidence, confidently standing and resting in his grace. Because here's a scripture I left out, and I think it's very fitting. It's in Galatians. I think it's Galatians 5. But it says, if you are seeking to be justified by the law, right? If you're believing, but you're not confessing Jesus, if you are seeking to be justified by the law, right? Your good works, your keeping of the law. If this is your justification, well, the Bible says in Galatians that you have then fallen from grace, right? You have fallen from grace. How we need to remain in Jesus. That's where the grace is at. In Jesus. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these many examples. Lord, I pray that there would be something that penetrated all of us here today. Lord, and that you would begin to work those things into our heart so that then they will display themselves outwardly so that as the heart begins to be clean, that the outside then matches the inside. Lord, help us to continue to deny ourselves. It's so easy to do, to just be consumed by ourselves. But yet we find that if we live for ourselves, then we're going to be full of ourselves. But if we live for you, Jesus, then there's just great joy there's a, a life worth living. A life that isn't so concerned and focused on self, it's concerned on others. Father, I pray for myself first that you would forgive me, God, and cleanse me. Lord, that I would have eyes like you have to see the way that you see, to have ears to hear the way that you hear. Lord, help our feet to be busy about your business. Lord, let your words of grace and truth be on our lips. May we always be looking to build up, Lord, and not tear down. As we're going to see this spirit of, of Satan that you don't, we don't have to be demon-possessed to be used by Satan, this spirit of the Antichrist. And one of the biggest tools is discouragement. Help me not to be a discourager, Lord, but to be a a builder up. And so, Father, thank you again for today. Thank you for your word. Watch us as we go. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if we have the, want to have the ushers come forward here, we'll go ahead and distribute the communion elements as Toby plays something for us and The 
Toby, thank you. I just need to get this off of my chest. And so I'd ask that you would just take a moment and just take everybody out of your mind right now, the people sitting next to you, and really just try to, I'm not trying to get hokey or anything, but just imagine that it's just you and the Lord right now. That it's just Jesus there, right in front of you, face to face with you. Now close your eyes for a minute, and I, I want to just read this scripture to you. And as I'm reading it, just hear Jesus saying this to you. And then after I read it, begin to pray however the Spirit moves you to pray. And then we'll enter into communion. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Father, I just pray now, Lord, that you would fill us with your love, God. We need your love. And I thank you that you showed us how much you love us in sending Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, to cancel out our debt of sin. Let it be the love of God that compels us to love you back. Father, help us to continue to deny ourselves and to love others. We need your love to be able to do this, God. Jesus, thank you for willfully resting there on the cross, shedding your blood, as we know that there is no remission for sin unless there is shedding of blood. A covenant cannot be instituted unless it is in blood. And so we thank you for this new covenant that by the shedding of your blood that our sins have been forgiven. That our debts have been paid in full. And thank you for the glorious hope that we have that you didn't stay in that tomb that you were resurrected and that you are now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Lord, thank you for your spirit that is here with us and living within us, that is working these truths into our heart. I thank you that we aren't alone. 
I thank you for the comforter. I thank you for our teacher. As truly it's your spirit that teaches us all truth and brings to remembrance those things that you have said to us. And how we need that. That's the understanding that we were talking about earlier. Remembering the things that you have already done. And that beautiful promise in Hebrews 10 that is just that. It's a promise that you are faithful. So Jesus, as we now break this bread and drink this juice, we do it in honor and remembrance of you and pray that you would just continue the work that you began. Help us to be pliable. Help our hearts to stay pliable, God, not to get jaded, not to get hardened towards your word or towards others. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and take the bread and break the bread. And the juice. God bless you guys today. Please stand. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name to remember. Jesus is the only name. My Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name to remember. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name to remember. Yeah. Uh -huh.